Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prose Garden. I'm your host, Francine Witt, in New York City, and your other host, Meg Pokris, is in the UK, and uh, she'll be on in just a bit. Today, we're going to hear a wonderful reading of um, flash and prose poetry and memoir and who knows what. So anyway, just um, settle back, and we're so glad you're here joining us today. Um, I'm going to start, we like to, Meg and I like to sort of warm it up with a micro each, just to kind of get things, uh, you know, so, so you're settled in nice and comfy. Okay, mine is a sort of, a, I think it's a prose poem. It's one of those prose poem micro things that we're never really sure which is which. Um, definition. The little boy asks his family what a lemon is. The mother mostly apron, says, oh, I use it in my cooking, also to sprinkle on fish. The father, who is rumpled like the evening paper, says, ha, a lemon is the car your mother's brother sold me. Boy's older sister is boy drunk and says she used lemons to bleach freckles off her face and also to blonde up her hair. The boy then asks about his grandmother, I'm sorry, the boy then asks his grandmother what a lemon is. She is round-shouldered and pucker-skinned. She only comes downstairs once a day now. Other times, she is in the attic where she lives. A tiny window, a tinier view. She says the sun is a lemon, sometimes a slice, sometimes a wedge. It fits different each day in the window, and each day a little less yellow than it was the day before. Thank you. Um, and I also um, encourage everybody to use the chat and um, put any, any comments. People love to see comments. Okay, well, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my lovely co-host um, from Scotland, um, Meg Pokris. Thank you so much, Francine. It's really exciting to have you all here tonight. I'll start with a micro of mine called Animal Loops, which appeared in Gone Lawn. Animal Loops. Bob in his nice suit opened the door when he heard the scratching and at first he didn't see anything at all. He didn't see anything at all because the sound was a light scraping of a rat. The rat, cold in the wet and terrible night, was trying to get inside. Trying to get inside, this was clearly someone's escaped pet. A pet who needed immediate care and rescue, thought Bob, who had been living in a mental desert since the death of the Flemish rabbit, Yvonne. Yvonne had passed away right after Bob had folded up her new little bedding blanket when he turned around and she was like a piece of common fluff, no longer his living animal. No longer his living animal. Bob remembers touching the rabbit to see if she was cold, picking her up and holding her near his heart. Near his heart, it hurts since the death of the rabbit, and he was pleased to see that a rat had found its way to his front door. A front door kind of guy, Bob felt unchallenged by the moment and let the rat inside. He let the rat inside, and the rat had a look on its face of pleasure. Bob scooped the rat up remembering holding his pet rat as a boy, remembering how to love it. To love, Bob felt, would be so damned easy. Easy does it, he said to the rat, who bit him on the hand, drawing blood. So I am going to introduce our wonderful featured reader tonight, which is Michael Martone. Michael Martone's recent books include Plain Air, Sketches from Winesburg, Indiana, the Complete Writings of Art Smith, The Bird Boy of Fort Wayne, edited by Michael Martone. The Moon Over Wapakoneta, I hope I pronounced that right. Brooding and Memoranda. His stories and essays have appeared in Harper's, Esquire, Story, Antius, North American Review, Benzene, Epoch, Denver Quarterly, Iowa Review, Third Coast, Shenandoah, Bomb, Story Quarterly, American Short Fiction, and other magazines. 
Michael Martone is now Emeritus Professor at the University of Alabama, where he has been teaching since 1996. He has been a faculty member of the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College since 1988. He also taught at Iowa State University, Harvard University, and Syracuse University. Welcome, Michael Martone. Hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? All right. So you want me to read now, right? Yes? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm yeah. going to read from uh, the newest book. It just came out uh, that's sort of not a book, and maybe I can talk about that later, but um, it's a special issue uh, issued by Booth Magazine, if you know Booth Magazine. And um, the, uh, the book is called Table Talk and um, Table Talk and Second Thoughts. And it's a collection of uh, prose poems, anecdotes of my 40 years of hanging out with uh, really great writers. Um, and so uh, great writers and just writers. Um, but it is uh, kind of um, uh, these little anecdotes are um, what uh, a minor writer sort of in the presence of greatness, I guess. Um, so I'll just read three of them, uh, very short, um, and the three Nobel Prize winners uh, I've met. A, a table talk is, uh, it goes back actually to Martin Luther. That was the first table talk, and it's a subgenre of the memoir. Um, so a lot of these, uh, as many of you know, uh, a reader comes and reads and then goes out and has drinks or has dinner, and at the table, things happen. Cake, I-35, Iowa, 1983. Iowa State University lent me a car, I didn't have a car, to go to Des Moines Airport and pick up me, uh, Cheslo Miłosz and drive him back to Ames for a lecture and a reading. A Polish math professor went with me. On the trip there, we talked about the work in the fields. Miłosz had just won the Nobel Prize, and on the way back, I pointed out the harvested and turned fields on both sides of the highway. The dirt looks like chocolate cake, he said. The math professor in the back seat said then that they were going to speak Polish now, and they did all the rest of the way back to Ames. I understood nothing. Exacto, Syracuse, 1993. During the small talk at dinner that night, I wanted to ask Louise Gluck about the X-Acto knife. Her father, I thought, had invented it for use as a scalpel, but it couldn't be cleaned. He had been talking about the whites, we had been talking about the white space between the print and collage. I mentioned Francis, Francis Ponge and how she was interested in everyday objects like soap and knives. Louise cut in right there. She, she said, wasn't a she, but a he. Right then, dessert arrived. Spade, Cambridge, 1990. Everyone thinks Harvard University is rich, but it is cheap when it comes to phones. My office at 34 Kirkland Street was next to Seamus Haney's, and we shared a party line that rang all the time. The calls were almost always for him from all over the world. I took messages, and when he returned, we would have lunch in his office to review them. We would also talk about gardens and how we missed having one in the city. When I left to take a new job in a city where I could have a garden, Seamus gave me a garden spade, a ribbon around its handle, which is, after all these years and many gardens, still there, hanging by a few threads. Thanks. Is, is okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It was amazing to hear you read your work. I have been a fan for many years. Um, it was a slightly shorter reading than we were expecting that. I just want to make sure that you're that you've read. Oh, yeah, no, I, didn't, I knew that we're there are going to be a lot of readers, so I wanted to. Oh, you know, okay, right that's, so, that's so kind. Okay, well, anyway, it was that that was wonderful. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit a bit more about Table Talk and, and how it evolved. 
um, what inspired Table Talk and, and these pieces, that would be great. Yeah, um, I have another book um, that is called uh, Michael Martone. And I always say I like books that have titles, you know, that are names, David Copperfield, um, Jane Eyre, Michael Martone. Uh, but it's made up um, of something that you all do, all, all, and that is uh, the contributor's note. And I know that there are a lot of editors here. Um, and it was always weird to me as a writer uh, that uh, if you get something published in the front of the book, the editor says, uh, send a contributor's note. And we automatically like switch to the third person and we have this, this idea of form in mind, um, the, these little flash forms. And so I started... Um, uh, doing a kind of memoir in contributors notes that became Michael Martone. Um, and those contributors notes um, often contradict each other, uh, the, uh, the biography that's uh, possessed in there. But I do think of it as a memoir. I think of it as uh, possibilities and uh, perhaps false memories, et cetera, et cetera. And um, at the end of my 40 years of teaching, I thought um, I'd sort of revisit the form of a serial memoir like Contributor's Notes. Uh-oh, am I frozen? I'm frozen. No, you're not frozen. Okay. Um, and uh, um, so I thought I'd revisit that. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to write um, about the life of a writer, the 40 years that I worked as a writer at universities, um, but not in an exciting way. <laughs> not, I didn't want to have any talk or any thought really about writing uh, because that maybe could be in other things. Instead, I wanted sort of anecdotes of uh, writers like us in all the other times that we're interacting that's not about the seriousness of the work. Um, so I just started thinking of anecdotes. And the other thing I, I'd say is for the last five or six Augusts, I've worked with, um, uh, postcards, um, uh, postcard poetry, um, out of Washington. And so these, uh, particular anecdotes, uh, the form I wanted to do was be able to put them on a postcard typed with a postcard, an anecdote that short and in a way kind of boring, but just still stuck in my memory. So long answer to that, so That's serial great. memoir. Thank you. I feel so lucky to have received some of your postcards over the years, it's been so fun. Um, many of us are fond of your regular Facebook posts about chair of the day and various photos of people, including yourself wearing hats. I so enjoy these quirky collections of yours and thank you so much for sharing them with us. Can you talk a little bit about how all of that got started, your Facebook posts and your collections, chairs of the day and hats? Yeah, yeah um, I, I always love to quote and I can't find it now, of course, but I, I attribute it to uh, Donald Barlamé who said, I want to be on the leading edge of the junk phenomena. And what what I thought about myself um, and why I like that quote is I'm a, I think I'm not a, a storyteller. Um, I don't write short, short stories. I, if I write anything, I write short fictions. Um, my teacher was John Barth and I'd bring in these things and he'd say, you know, these aren't stories. And he's a very technical guy. No, they're not stories. He said, but that's okay. We'll call them fictions. Um, and um, so I'm lyrical and I'm nominative. I can't make anything move. And so I'm in the world of the junk phenomena, just the thingness of things. And because um, I'm a lyrical writer instead of a, um, a narrative writer, what becomes important are um, juxtaposition as opposed to um, connection or, you know, building of drama or things like that, uh, juxtaposition as well as um, variation 
And then the problem becomes, uh, if you're not using the upside down check mark of narrative, how do you give a sense of an ending? Or, you know, the, it's a complete thing in a lyrical world. And so I go back to uh, poetry, which has the same problem, lyrical poetry. And a lot of it is repetition and in a kind of exhaustion of uh, numbers often, 12 days, 24 hours in a day or 12 months, uh, seven days in a week, that type of thing, or uh, other arbitrary sorts of um, uh, numbers that feel like a completeness. So the chairs and the, uh, the hats and uh, the repetition of Facebook, which is of course a huge collage that we're all contributing to all the time. You know, what interests me is the juxtaposition of one image next to the other, and um, and then how the images I post actually chime and rhyme with images other people are posting uh, when it comes to sharing. So um, in a way, I guess I think, you know, that writing on Facebook is just like any other writing I'm doing, I'm taking it as seriously as, as other things, as I think you do too. Yeah, I yeah, think no, is Facebook is like the ultimate improv experience as a writer, because you get to react to other people and change, you know, based on what other people, how other people react to you. I, I love it. It feels it feels like theater, but I feel like it's definitely that way for you. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things is um, what I was always interested in was signature, you know, and the appearance of signature with writers. And Shakespeare supposedly has six different extant signatures. That is, you know, each signature isn't, the whole idea of signature was sort of about the time of Shakespeare and Shakespeare being the first author we connect with the name. Uh, but I think of the time before Shakespeare and say the creation of cathedrals, you know, that there are, all of these artists building these cathedrals and they're unsigned. And so what really interests me about Facebook is it's our kind of cathedral. You know, the fact that I don't sign the work in, in the same way I sign it when I send it off to a magazine or something like that is interesting to me that, that we are all contributing to this cathedral called Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so. It's pretty wonderful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I was wondering what is next for you these days? What What are you working on now? Well, another sort of weird book, I think. Um, it's called Fort Fort Wayne. Um, I haven't really talked about that. Why am I still stuck in the Midwest? Um, but um, it, the basic structure of it is uh, a, a person there who's working in tourism or, you know, city development is uh, sad that the town is, uh, Rust Belt town has been sort of emptied out and he wants to save it by creating a tourist, um, a tourist uh, attraction in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he comes up with the idea that Fort Wayne, Indiana will be the only walled city in North America. Well, actually, that's not true. Montreal is, but or Quebec is, but it'll be a walled city that people will come to visit the wall that will now be built around Fort Wayne, Indiana. So it's a book of forts. It's a book of walls, which is, you know, thank you, former President Trump, for putting walls in our minds again. But it's all about walls, all about brick, all about making walls. Uh, the history of forts and fortifications. So that's what I'm working on. How exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having so me. fun having you here. Such, such an honor. Um, oh, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and thanks so much, Michael. I'm going to turn it back to you now, Francine. Thank you. And thank you, Michael. And I just want you to know um, that the first time I met you was at uh, the uh, I think it was at the postgraduate um, Vermont College because I had got my gotten my MFA at my, Vermont College, 
and I saw you at a reading and you were reading from your contributors notes from Michael Martone. And that's how it, that's what first struck me about you. So the very, it was wonderful. And it just great to hear your insights on everything and, and about and about your work. So thank you for being with us. Thank you so um, much for the invitation. Thank you. I want to move on to um, our other readers. And um, I before I do, I want to give a little shout out, as I like to do, to some of the people <clears throat> just in the Zoom room here with us um, who are just major um, parts of the community. And we're just so delighted you're here. Uh, Lorette Luzajic, Dawn Steffler, Michelle Ross, Josh Jones, Jessica Clemish, Epiphany Farrell, Tim Horvath, B. Knightley, Caleb Cloud, J uh, Deborah J.S., uh, Jace Barrel. If I missed you, I'll get you on the... Luella maybe. Lester. Luella Lester. I didn't see you there, Luella. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, we're, we're just delighted to have you. I, you know, the thing that, if you remember the... Um, uh, the the woman who gave the uh, rebuttal, to, not the rebuttal, the response to the State of the Union, she kind of ruined, I see you <laughs> for me. I used to like to say that, I, we see you, you know, we see, we know you're here. Oh, and, but she's ruined that. We see you, we hear you, we can't, we can't do that anymore. So, but anyway, we, I see you. Um, and thank you for being here. And um, so now we're going to move on. Uh, we can hear from six wonderful readers. First is Patricia Bedar, and uh, I just got her new baby in the in the mail today, yesterday. Wild Plum. She'll tell you a little bit about that. Patricia Bedar's work has been included in Flash Fiction America, which is the Norton anthology. Best Small Fictions 23 and 24, Best Microfiction 23, nominated six times for the Pushcart Prize. Her book of short fiction, Pardon Me for Moonwalking, is forthcoming from Unsolicited Press. She lives with her family and an unusual dog outside of Oakland, California. Patricia Bedar. Thank you. I am so happy to see everyone. And already I've learned so much, which I you know, you always learn in these things, for sure, hearing the readers, but um, Michael Martone, you are a fascinating person. I was taking notes during a, during your talk and, and your reading, uh, just fascinating. Uh, I don't want to hold things up, so what I will do is uh, throw a link to that uh, novelette, and, and, and a novelette in this case is really just a long, short story uh, that just came out, uh, ELJ Publications, or ELJ Press. Um, and I will start reading right now. Okay, two, two microfictions. Just bear with me. Uh, a vendor weeps at the inland farmer's market is the title. She is always there, tight skirted with long black hair. She cries as she weighs out peaches or turnips, arranges strawberry baskets on her oilskin skirted table, proffers a paper plate of pluot samples, Perhaps one Thursday in five, her face is dry, and on those days, a manic fire fuels her axe. Will tomorrow be a weeping day or a dry one? I am in bright Seattle on vacation. Will miss the tears, or will I miss tears or the electric gesture? It's the last days of our trip, and we're he heading for the Chihuly Museum. Anemone tendrils forged in fire, a mermaid's purse in glass. These four days, I've kept wishing for specific outcomes and have always been disappointed. On Thomas Street, in my pencil skirt, I rush to match my lover's heedless stride. And the second one's called Adding Machine, and this story is uh, going to be published in, um, in April by uh, Bending Genres. And I just wrote it. <laughs> I wrote it, like, extremely recently. Adding Machine. Acapulco. It's Miller and Hermione and a younger couple, the Abelmans. The trip's been planned for months. Resort fees paid. Hermione's broken leg and hard plaster cast is accommodated, meaning she's left out of snorkeling and bar hopping in town. Instead, she sweats over Miller's poetry, which she's been tasked to edit. Miller keeps saying he'll look into a wheelchair rental. 
Twilight time emits from tree-mounted loudspeakers. Iguanas bask. So he pops it, misses the gin glass on her head. Old Bill got off with a two-year suspended sentence, Miller is saying. Hitches his trunks, tongues of pineapple slice. Artists, drawls Daphne Abelman on her back in a web chaise, arms hanging down. Who's William S. Bulow, asks Buzz Alderman. So fresh-faced. A line of fine hairs run from below his navel to the lip of his trunks. Hula girls. Ho, ho, Burroughs, only the greatest living poet, returns Miller, mudding Buzz's hair, disappearing the too white, too straight part. Off to his wife and got off clean. Isn't that right, Hermione? Look out, Daphne. Ho, ho. He's much better known as a prose writer, Hermione returns. His glee is no shock. Whatever nest, Tangier and hallucinogens? They weren't from social register families. Hermione supports them with her work as a bookkeeper. Hermione's been brought a plate of skewered shrimp and oddly a bowl of fruit. She strips the skewer with her naked mouth. The courteous pool man brings another round of mescal drinks. Hermione slugs hers, lifts her glass to signal for another. Daphne's fully collapsed while, uh, while um, Hermione watches Biller, Miller and Buzz sway to little Anthony and the Imperials. The wet heat silhouettes of iguanas, the shh of palm fronds. When Hermione opens her eyes, the two men are chest to chest near the edge of the pool. The hula girl's still barely visible. Senior Miller, time for our William Tell act? Hermione winds up, let's fly. Her third pitch connects, an apple appropriately. It connects with Miller's jaw. He goes down hard. The pool man appears, removes every dirty plate and glass. The pool lights turn off, then on, then off, then on, the way theater lights link before the final act begins. Thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me, Francine and Meg. Thank you, Patricia. That was really wonderful. I don't mute yourself yet because I wanted to just ask you um, what you have coming up and uh, where we can find you. If we wanted you to buy uh, um, I did, um, <laughs> I did uh, put the, the link for this novelette by Plums um, in the chat. And I, I do have a website, patriciacubidar.com. Great. And yeah. So we'll look forward to uh, to hearing you in the future. Thank you for yeah. being here. Thank you. Starting. Yeah. Lovely to have you. Um, and uh, Michael, back to Michael Martone, back to you. Uh, where can someone get in touch with you and find you and find out more about your work? Uh, oh, boy. Um, we can follow you on Facebook. And Facebook. See your wonderful hat. Facebook, yes. And, uh, and Instagram. And uh, my son actually works for Squarespace. And so uh, recently for um, uh, Father's Day gift, uh, gave me a website, which, Wonderful. yeah, yeah, which is uh, yeah, interesting. So um, it's uh, fourforaquarter.com. Ah, wonderful. Well, thank you, because we'll look for you. We're going to oh, definitely look, we're going to hunt you down, Michael Martone. Um, thank you. And thank you again, Patricia. Um, Next, we have Suda Balakapal. Did I say that right, Suda? Suda Balakapal work appears in, in fine journals worldwide. Her novella in Flash, Nose Ornaments, which is a wonderful book, was runner up in the Beth Novella in Flash contest 2024 and will be published by Ad Hoc Fiction soon. Her words have been included in Best Small Fictions, Best Microfiction, and the Wiggly. Top 50, Suda Balagapal. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, Francine. <clears throat> so I'm going to read one, uh, one story. The Year of the Flood. It's the year Sia and you practice French kissing on the mirror. The year you shave your tufty underarms with a rusty razor 
and tweeze your eyebrows into surprised arches. The year seer writes letters to the young man next door. The year you help her sprinkle emotion, offering words like yearning and pining. The year the mighty Ganges shrugs off her embankments after a long, hot summer. The year you fall in love with love. It's the year you drool over Mr. Darcy and moan over Romeo and Juliet in your textbooks. The year you're subjected to relentless coaching, English, Hindi, mathematics, chemistry, history, physics, even as you crave golden mangoes and juicy stories. The year the open air terrace becomes your escape as you thirst for evening breezes and neighborhood dalliances. The year you notice a man slipping in the dark of dusk to visit the beautiful widowed lady at the end of the street and Sia asks, how can love be linked to the word illicit? It's the year you read and reread tattered copies of Mills and Boone romances borrowed from the circulating library. The year biology homework languishes even as Amma, a school headmistress, repeats, procrastination is the thief of time. The year you ignore her wise sayings, fret over shoulder sweeping earrings and hard to find clogs instead. The year you decide you'll never pierce your nostrils because you don't want your nose to look like your mother's. The year you splish splash through puddle streets in the torrential monsoon rain. It's the year you stop playing Killing Me Softly on your cassette player because Sia looks as melancholy as the vapor-laden clouds above. The year you purchase overpriced tickets from a scalper to watch Julie and drown in the angst of the movie's forbidden romance. The year the young man from next door slides in next to Sia and drapes an arm over her shoulders. The year your washed garments hang for days, listless, smelly, and damp on the clothesline in the veranda. It's the year you practice draping a sari and strut on your driveway, pretending to be an auntie, even as Sia struggles with homework. The year she whispers on the phone just once, I feel hopeless, with the three breath pause between the hope and the less. The year no one from her family will answer your knocks on their door. The year Amma says Sia was married off quietly in another town, it's for the best. The year you ask, 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 what's best about it? What about love? And Amma stands straight to respond, yes, what about it? As if book life and real life are unrelated. The year she notices Sia's befuddled young man hovering and tells you, you're known by the company you keep. It's the year Aman you gasp as the angry swollen Ganges invades your home. The year you flee to the terrace above. The year you lean over the parapet. The year you watch your favorite things, shoulder sweeping earrings, clogs, pride and prejudice, Romeo and Juliet and tattered Mills and Boone romances float in murkiness. And that's all I'm going to read, just one. Thank you so much, Suda. That was beautiful. Um, I love your black and white, by the way. <laughs> I always think I'm talking to you from the 1940s, <laughs> which is awesome. You're very film noir. Um, I noticed that, you know, well, I didn't just notice it. I know that this is your second novella in Flash coming out. What is it about? Because you've had another one um, published by Ad Hoc. Mm -hmm. And what is it that attracts you so much about that form? Um, I love Flash. Yeah. And if I want the Flash to become a longer overarching story, I find it 
it works in the novella and fl flash form where each, each chapter is the length of a flash, but the characters are related in some form. So I have the same characters coming up in the stories and then the story moves forward, but at the same time, there is a brevity and the tightness. Uh, and I feel that the impact is, it's just something I, I love to do. I mean, I start with one flash and I, I, I like that flash so much that I want to keep going. So I start another flash and that's how it moves on and it ultimately becomes a longer novella and flash. Well, that's really wonderful. And um, this uh, nose ornaments is just beautiful and look forward to it being out in the world. And where could people find you, Suda? Uh, on my website, uh, sudabalagopal.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. And, uh, you know, so you can find me. Uh, uh, I, yep, and I'm here. We <laughs> so, will certainly be looking for you, Suda. Thank you so much. I, I just also want to mention, uh, thank you, Francine, for providing the blurb. There are two people that provided a blurb for nose ornaments here. Michael, uh, Susanievsky and Francine, thank you for your blurbs. I appreciate it very much. Also, I just found out that this particular uh, chapter that I read is going to be included in Best Small Fictions 2024. Oh my goodness. Yeah. How wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah. It's just awesome. Um, thank you so much, Suda. Thank you. Um, and um, I want to also give a shout out to Nancy Ortman, Carmen Curtin, and Sylvia Peck. And again, if I missed anybody, just uh, give me a nudge in the chat and say, hey, what about me? Okay. Or, you know, something of that nature. Because um, we're so glad you're here, really. Um, so um, next is the aforementioned, okay, I like to say the same, Michael Chisniewski. I hope I said that right, or even close to right. Um, is the author of four collections of stories, most recently the, Am the Amnesiac in the Maze from Braddock Avenue Books 2023. He serves as editor-in-chief of Moon City Press and Moon City Review, as well as interviews editor of Smoke Loan Quarterly. He has received a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts and two Pushcart Prizes. Michael Chisniewski. Thanks, Francine. Thanks, Meg, for having me for this. Uh, I love the series. Uh, I'm honored to read with all these great readers, especially Michael, um, who is a great inspiration to me and I've known for a long time. So this is quite the honor. Okay, I'm going to read one story and it's about eight minutes. I timed it, so we're good. Uh, this story was in Frigg late last year. It's called On the Heels of the Snowman. We have trailed the snowman for three days, nearly three days longer than we'd anticipated. Like our water, morale runs thin. Benny on point assures us we're on his heels, that it's just a matter of time. The cowboy and I remain doubtful, want to abandon the mission, but cannot find our way from the veldt without Benny. The cowboy says it'll be worth it. I hope he's right. The farther we go, the fiercer the mosquitoes become. I asked the cowboy if mosquitoes bite snowmen, and he theorizes they do. Snowmen, a phenomenal source of water. Benny orders us to keep quiet, says if he can hear us, the snowmen can hear us too. The cowboy gives Benny the finger, but behind his back. No risk, no reward. I leave gallons of sweat on the jungle floor, yet the snowman doesn't lose an ounce. We caught sight of him earlier today, as thick as ever, on the ledge below a cliff, two clicks ahead. The cowboy knelt and took a shot, missed badly, the snowman dashing out of sight. Benny scolded the cowboy for his shit aim. I reassured the cowboy we'd get him next time, wondering who I was trying to convince. The cowboy thinks the snowman is leading us in circles, hoping to break our spirit. It's working. Several times we passed a banyan tree shaped like the number four. Benny doesn't believe the tree to be the same until I tie my white bandana around a branch, only to see it again 90 minutes later. While Benny keeps silent, I know he's discouraged, his pace and fervor tripling from this point on. I did not know these men until four days ago. I was sitting in a bar near the bazaar, swimming in bourbon, double, doubting a whole string of life choices. I put out the word I was looking for work, and after three weeks of killing brain cells, the cowboy appeared. Benny had hired him that morning, the two meeting on the train. They needed a third. Benny had lost his former crew, two long timers on his last hunt. 
I heard the rumors, Benny executing them for attempted desertion. All the more reason to see this to its end, to not cross Benny, to defeat the snowman and go home. Neither the cowboy or I are sure who is paying Benny to take down the snowman, let alone how much. I know what I'm being paid, which I assume is less than the cowboy and ridiculously less than Benny. Both have been at this longer, boast considerable reputations. I was a seal, but out here it doesn't matter what you did for some government. Governments have rules. Guys like the cowboy and Benny don't answer to anyone. We reached the ledge where we last saw the snowman, where he stood when the cowboy took his failed shot. Benny finds the bullet lodged in a boulder, scrapes it out with his bowie knife, and tosses it to the cowboy. Lose this, he says. It's the first time Benny has exhibited anything resembling a sense of humor. Benny attempts to recreate the shot, gauge the snowman's path. The cowboy, in the meantime, spots something on the ledge. A carrot. I wounded him, the cowboy declares. The cowboy walks to the ledge and immediately slips, arms fail flailing, falling to his death. Benny approaches the carrot spread eagle. Ice, he says. He picks up the carrot, flicks his tongue along its length. Fucker used his own nose as bait. This confirms what we've known for a while. As long as we're tracing the snowman's steps, the snowman has the advantage. We need to hunker down, wait for the snowman to come to us. Benny sends me into the jungle, tossing me the machete from his hip. I need to cut as many vines as I can find. I follow the path to the north side of the ledge, scale the side of the cliff until I can see the whole jungle. Less than a click south, I spy a rush of lianus. I make my way there and hack off as many as I can carry. On my way back, I hear a human scream. Benny. I drop the vines and sprint back to the ledge. Lying in a half-dug foxhole is Benny's corpse, an icicle as long as and as thick as my arm poking through his chest. Within minutes, the weapon has melted. It looks like Benny has been stabbed by nothing. I wander the jungle for a day, subsisting on the collective water of three canteens. When that's gone, I drop my pack, keeping only my weapons and the clothes on my back. I come across the banyan tree in the shape of a four. My bandana is missing. I try to remember if I or one of the others reclaimed it. In my heart, I know we did not. The snowman is close, and I am powerless against him. I sling my rifle over my shoulder, remove the clip, and toss it into the jungle. I sit on the bottom leg of the four, contemplating my situation, think of everything I might not ever see again. My parents, my dog, baseball, a woman. I wait. The snowman is not there. I look down at my watch. I look up again. He's right in front of me. He is much larger up close, nearly eight feet tall. Half of his height has bottom ball. His dead branch arms grab me, his coal eyes reaching into mine. Who sent you? I don't know, I say. Bullshit. I tell the snowman about the bar, about Benny. He relaxes his grip and settles next to me. Where are you from, he asks. Chicago. Part of me formed in Chicago, he says, nearly 17%. The snowman takes a long drag off his corncob pipe with a yarny mouth then offers it to me. I hesitate, but he insists. I take a drag, tasting the most exquisite tobacco I can imagine. How are the bears this year, the snowman asks. Shitty. I'm guessing. It's been years since I've checked. That's too bad, he says. We're silent for a while. Sometimes I look over at him. He catches me staring at the hole where his nose used to be. I apologize. He says it's no big deal that there are other carrots. I remember I have his, pull it out of my pocket and hand it to him. I was going to eat it, but forgot I had it. The snowman wedges the carrot back into place. Obliged, he says, his voice more pronounced, less breathy. The snowman takes off his black top hat and sets it on the ground. He wipes his forehead, leaving a dent. He catches me staring again. What, he says, your hat. I thought if you took it off, you'd stop being alive. The snowman laughs. You watch too much TV. From inside his vest pocket, the snowman pulls out my white bandana and he ties it around his head. I look at the top, uh, his top hat on the ground, kick it with my toe. Do you mind, I ask? Not at all. The inside of his hat is lined with silk. I put my hand in and just feel the smooth material, cool to the touch, like silk sheets. Go ahead, the snowman says. You know you want to. I lift the hat 
onto my head and pull down. It fits you, the snowman says, that begins to roll away. I'm sorry, he says to me. For what? I feel it. The coolness of the hat turns to cold on my head, inside my skull. I try to lift my arms to take off the hat, but see they are freezing. I try to stand, but can't. My legs freezing, too. My bones and organs hurt like a burn from dry ice. Then I don't feel at all. The snowman takes his hat off my head and puts it back on his over my bandana. I think I might defrost, turn back to normal, but I don't. I can't move my mouth. It's becoming hard to think. You lose consciousness before you melt, the snowman says. That's good. You don't want to feel yourself melting. The snowman disappears into the brush. I think I spot him again, just a flash of white in the emerald canopy. Then my eyeballs freeze and I stop seeing. I exhale one last breath, imagining the steam rising in front of my face, a steaming ice statue in a jungle, soon to be no one, soon to be nothing. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. How wonderful that was, Michael. Um, really enjoyed that. Thank you for being here. And um, what are you working on? Would you have anything special coming up? Or um, I had a book come out last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to put the link so people can get it. If you don't have it, it's in the chat there. Um, mm -hmm. It's the Amnesiac in the, ba in the Maze from Braddock Avenue Books. Um, I'm working on a flash collection that is probably, I need to probably check the page count on that pretty soon because it's probably <laughs> maybe already too long. Yeah, that's a way, that's a way of getting away from you, I know. Yeah. But um, yeah, well, we look forward to that, Michael. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and um, I wanted to um, give a shout out to Andrea Marcusa, who is our bouncer today. Uh, so if you are on our naughty list, still get you. Okay. Thank you so much, Andrea. And Andrea and I, oddly enough, live a mile away from each other, if that. And we see each other more at Zoom readings, you know. So, but <laughs> to say thank you, sometime I'm going to take you out for coffee again. So we'll meet up. We're going to change that, Francine. We'll do it. <laughs> for sure. Great. It's a date. Um Thank you so much. Okay, next we have Catherine Culpa. Catherine Culpa is a New England-based writer with work in Fictive Dream, Fractured Lit, Ghost Parachute, Last Cow Review, and Tramp Set. Her work has been fe featured in Best Microfiction and the Wigleaf Long List. She is the author of a chapbook, Cooking Tips for, Demon ha for the Demon Haunted, and winner of the Gold Line Press chapbook competition for her forthcoming collection. Catherine Copa. Thank you, Francine and Meg, for inviting me. Um, and yes, Epiphany, um, yeah, doesn't live near anyone except apparently my um, doppelganger who talking through Indiana at this point. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a couple of micros. And... Guest house. Those years you lived in his shadow, candy colored cottage by the pool. You couldn't get mail delivered because he was still married, technically. You'd float on your back, searching for stars, underwater lights, bioluminescing bare skin, waiting for your sullen troubadour to call. I'm here, you'd whisper. I'm still here. And I don't know if this can compete with the carrot, but this piece was um, published in Unbroken. It's called Self-Portrait as a Root Vegetable. Not the perfect ear of corn plucked from the field that morning, dew still on the stalk, each kernel firm as a tiny pearl, corn silk gleaming platinum, the Jean Harlow of corn, a silver queen on a silver screen lounging, in white satin, not corn at all, nor just ripe strawberries, jewel red, exhaling their dense perfume of musk and honey, bee buzzed summer meadows, evenings in June, not those, but a fleshy rutabaga, hard skin, dull with dirt, only a bristly brush could remove, a vegetable that lives in the bottom bin, 
in a dark root cellar, a wary cave dweller, tempting no one with its color, revealing nothing by its smell, inviting no one to take a bite, a sad turnip's sadder cousin waiting for a star turn on Kitchen Impossible, waiting to be discovered by a top chef, a creative cook who sees beyond the obvious, who knows the magic of heat and sweet and salt, of contrast and caramelization, a chef who can tease with butter and cheese and draw out from this humble root the richness of soil and seasons, the secret kernel of flavor, the one star turn even humble things must have. Okay, and I am also, I'm going to finish with a story that was published in Fictive Dream during Flash Fiction February, and it's called, But You Can Never Leave. When winter comes, the clothesline tent moves from the backyard to the cellar, and there it stays. In our northern world, winter lasts six months or longer if it's in a mood. The cellar is grim and gray, exposed pipes and a cold cement floor, bare light bulbs with metal pull chains. But the tent is our own California, a pool float with a palm tree, our lawn ornament. Rope wraps around foundation poles and draped from the rope are cotton sheets washed thin, faded bedspreads with wild floral prints, all of them clothes pinned together, ragtag, crazy quilt, a floor softened by old sleeping bags and cushions from a sofa that moved from living room to den to the side of the road. Someone picked the sofa up, but not before we liberated the cushions. Inside the tent, flashlights throw palm tree shadows on fabric walls. OP and copper tone ads torn from magazines make our windows. It's nighttime even during the day. We are awake even in our dreams. We are spies, commandos. We call ourselves the borrower's club. We only take what we need. See batteries for our boom box single serve boxes of cereal, tiny bottles of rum and Grand Marnier used for flavoring cakes, but also quite acceptable in orange soda. Here we are forgotten and free. The light filtered through the faded bedspread is dusty and diffused, a desert light. When this bedspread lived on our parents' bed, our father slept under it. If he hated the big splashy flowers, orange and yellow and lime green, he never said, now the man who will be our stepfather makes our mother change the girly curtains, covers our butterfly wallpaper with plain white paint. He watches us, plotting which parts of us to change. In the cellar, he can't change anything. It's where we go to make ourselves small, make ourselves not seen, not found. Like butterflies under construction, we hide in our tent cocoon waiting for the day our wings stretch wide enough to carry us away. Each year at the end of summer, we would try on last year's school clothes and our mother would balance a ruler from our heads to the wall, lines showing how tall we'd grown penciled on that wall. Growing like weeds, our mother would say. The man who will be our stepfather hates weeds, pours gasoline on them to kill them. Now we line up head to head inside the tent, but leave no mark of how we've grown. Our job now is to be invisible. Like the lint people from stories we used to tell. They lived behind the dryer, took soft fuzz from the lint trap, formed it into clothes, faded into corners when you turn the light on. When something red had stained the fluff in the lint trap pink, we rejoiced knowing a little lint girl would have something to wear that wasn't gray. No one can hear us, probably, but we whisper anyway, never turn the volume on our boombox past two. We can hear everything that happens upstairs. Footsteps, TV laugh tracks, toilets flushing, voices raised. Do you mean to tell me you can't discipline your own children? We lean in close to the boombox. The cassette hisses, scraps of a DJ's voice caught at the start of a song we taped off the radio. We disappear ourselves into story. It's because they're dead, we say, 
They're all ghosts and the hotel is hell and that's why they can check out, but they can't leave. Ghosts are invisible, faded like an old bedspread. Like our mother's eyes this last year. We can try to be ghosts, but we know we're weeds. We will grow and grow. One day our tent won't hold us anymore. On that day, we'll dream ourselves a new home. We will tiptoe away, silent as girls in soft lint shoes. Thank you. Fantastic, Catherine. That was really wonderful. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about your upcoming collection? Um, sure. My most recent collection is uh, Cooking Tips for the Demon Haunted, which was published by New Rivers Press, which alas is no longer in existence, but I'm still selling copies. Um, there's a link on my website. I have an Etsy shop or you can just PayPal me, but I have two more. Um, I have a micro chapbook coming up from Pork Belly Press. I'm not sure of the publication date yet. And then I just won the um, chapbook contest from Goldline Press, which was super exciting. And that is, I think, either 2025, uh, most likely 2025, but possibly even 2026. So um, you can just follow me at katherinekolba.com and I'll post any updates that I get. Well, thank you so much. And I know you've been uh, really a wonderful editor at Cleaver. And... Um you know, along with uh, Andrea. And so um, thank you for that. Thank you for being such a wonderful editor there. Um, thank you. So thank you for joining us today, Catherine. And thank you. Um, I wanted to just mention that I met Catherine in real life um, last spring when Meg Pokers came to the US and um, we all hung out with Pam Painter who just fed us like so amazingly, Pam, you just need to put that in your bio that you're a chef, really, because you're a chef. Oh. And we just had the best time and we had a really beautiful lunch. And it was just, it was wonderful up, up around uh, Harvard. Pam lives in uh, Cambridge. So uh, it was wonderful to meet um, Catherine, wonderful see, to see Meg in person. I had met her before in person. And um, this is a pretty good segue, right? Um, because our next reader, in fact, is Pam Painter. So Pam Painter, Pamela Painter, is the award-winning author of five story collections and her individual stories have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies. She has received three Pushcart Prizes and her work has been staged by Word Theater in London, New York, and LA. Her story, Doors is being made into a short film. In other words, she's a baddie, okay? <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Pam Painter. Oh, Francine, thank you. And we did have fun, and Meg is going to be back this fall, so um, I hope we're going to have a reunion. So that, would, that would be fun. Michael, it was a pleasure to hear your your stories about your non-stories. Uh, anyway, always, always uh, delightful. So I'm going to read uh, two stories, two new stories. I'm actually still working on them, fussing with them. So the first one is Outside Our Neighbor's House. <clears throat> so much goes on outside their house that it's a wonder they have energy left over for whatever goes on inside as their backyard becomes a multi-generational playground where toddlers play dates, set the trampolines rusted, springs to screeching, culminating in tea parties with tiny plastic tables and overturned chairs, the lurid colors of candy, not complete without skin knees and wailings. I'm going to tell and accusations, she hit me first, that bring a pissed off parent streaking out through patio doors from whatever the hell they were doing. Then all too soon, teen pool parties blossom under a cloud of chlorine and a miasma of weed their water games of chicken coached the girls' boobs out of their skimpy two-piece suits, knees wrapped around the necks of clueless boys who rarely managed to get there any other way. And soon adult activities bring out the hors d'oeuvres and wives, lumpy under their one-piece suits they never get wet, followed by husbands in wife-beater tees, husbands wishing they were teenagers again, 
splashing their squealing wives, wanting them wet when they want them. And in the background, punk rock drowns out rap and then segues into Joe Green as Cheez-Its chips and hot salsa are washed down with keg beer, tequila, and gin. And soon, right on time, smoking grills burn the bloody steaks and thin burgers. All this beneath strung up lights, bestowing halos on strung out guests no longer happy. In fact, so much happens outside the neighbor's house that you wouldn't think there is time left over for a drug overdose, a failed suicide, incest, even murder. But you would be wrong. Uh, and then the uh, second story is called When Flashers Meet. I peer up and down the cereal aisle of Piggly Wiggly to make sure I'm alone. Then I lift down the oblong box of cornflakes and tuck its noisy contents deep inside the pocket of my late husband's trench coat. Dumb word, late. My old man used this trench coat for our 50 years of married life before he couldn't eat steak or ribs no more, never mind this here cereal. Some idiot probably wonders who steals cereal? Someone down and out like me, that's who. Special K, Rice Krispies, Cheerios, Wheaties. Milk turns it into a soggy soup, easy on my dentures. I steer my empty cart toward the dairy aisle where my bum knee knocks the damn box. I tell it just you shush as a pissy looking dude in a cowboy's jacket wheels his, cord around, his cart around the corner. He squints and says, are you talking to me? I figure his sorry day needs a surprise. I swing open my old man's coat and flash my cornflakes at him. His cart comes to a full stop. He peers around as if to say, do you see what I see? Then I note the pocket of his cowboy's jacket has a suspicious sagging lump. Aha. He catches me eyeing it, so he flashes his jacket full on. Clearly, a fat chicken is roosting in his right inside pocket. His beard can't hide his grin. I huff. Damn, chicken's way too much for me. He thinks on this, then he says, what do you want? I got another pocket. Meat department, maybe? I nod, swing my cart around and head for meat, red meat. I hear his cart following me. Oh, glory. It's been years since a brisket bubbled in my old oven, slathered in sliced onions. I choose a big fat slab and slide it forward. We exchange nods, then I wheel away to produce to find four onions. When he catches up to me near checkout, both his pockets are sagging. We check out in different lanes as if we don't know each other. I pay for one onion and keep the other three quiet in my second pocket. He buys a quart of chicken broth. We meet outside near his battered motorcycle. He transfers his chicken to a tattered saddle pouch and pulls out a piggly wiggly bag to make the brisket easy for me to carry home. I give him an onion. Well, he says. Well, I say. We aren't partners, we aren't anything, but we both find it hard to say goodbye. Uh, it's wonderful, Pam. Thank you so much. I love a good supermarket story. Um, uh, wonderful reading. Um, so what have you got, what are you working on right now, Pam? What have you got coming up? Oh, let's see. Um, two stories were up recently in X-Ray and a crastic uh, review to uh -huh. a, a painting that was just really bizarrely dark and, and anyway, memorable. And then, um, as you said, Doors is being made into a short film. It's now in post-production and it's a semi-finalist in something. And then I'm, I'm working on a, a flash collection, my first flash collection, but I can't find a title and I feel paralyzed. <laughs> without a title it, I it'll know. it'll come to you yeah promise <laughs> and yeah then, you know yeah. it could be just like a phrase in there or like it'll come to you these things okay. sort of work that way but um well that's great and we'll look forward to it and where can we find you pam do you have a website we could or a uh, follow you on facebook we'll follow you on facebook we'll hunt you down on facebook pam. okay yep. thank uh, you love the series Great. Thank you so much, Pam, for being here. Um, is everybody having a good time? I'm just having a great time. Um, 
my face hurts from smiling. <laughs> I know my face hurts. It's killing you, right? Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, now we're going to hear from our final reader, um, a good friend of mine, George Wallace. He is the editor of Poetry Bay, co-editor of Great Weather for Media. And he is the editor-in-chief of Flash Boulevard. You left that out of your bio, George, but I'm shouting you out. So yes, he's responsible for Flash Boulevard, everybody. Um, and um, writer in residence at the Walt Whitman Birthplace and author of 40 poetry collections. And that's um, 210 in dog collections. I think I have my math right. A prominent figure on the New York City poetry scene, he's a veteran journalist, travels worldwide to share his work. And that's no lie. My goodness, George is like everywhere. And is founder of the Poets Building Bridges, which is um, a great little Zoom series, which uh, you can find out about, Triangulating Groups of World Poets Monthly via Zoom. George Wallace. Oh, you made my face hurt, Francine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for uh, asking me on. Uh, thank you, Meg. And it was a delight to hear Michael Martone for the first time. I was very impressed with his uh, conversation at the end, especially. So um, I'm glad to contribute a couple of minutes of poems, which um, may pass for prose in some way and get through the, you know, get through uh, on, on prose garden. I'll read them very quickly to you. Thanks for the opportunity. Einstein in the park. Einstein was in Central Park by the Green Pavilion feeding peanuts to squirrels from a brown paper sack. A small girl watched from the opposite side of the lake, envious, shy, and alone. What is that old man doing with all those peanuts, she cried, and a scolding little look crossed her face. What mighty forces are at work in a small child, thought Einstein, and he frowned in her direction. The June wind stiffened in Einstein's hair. A stray flower danced across the lake. Oh, this is a terrible world, thought Einstein. Such a terrible terrible world to to bring such a small innocent child into and he began handing peanuts out to the squirrels faster faster than fast faster than the speed of light the women gathered by a wild mountain stream The women gathered by a wild mountain stream that moved snake-like out of the mountains. Though it was not a snake, a snake, though it was just a secret they kept from the men with their rudenesses and their flat-tongued lies. The women gathered by a wild mountain stream and it belonged to the women. It was their secret. They gathered there and went wading in the water and no man on earth could stop them. And oh, the generosity of their breasts, and oh, the roundness of their bellies, and oh, the hilarity and subversive freedom of their singing, far from the village and the calamity of nights and days. The women gathered by the river greener than green, greener than dragons, greener than apple flesh, and they went wading into the river together, deep deep into the river together until they were completely immersed, one with the wild mountain stream that moved snake-like out of the mountains, one with a serpentine, one with sweet undulation, so deeply moved, so deeply moving together, 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 their hair loosed their lips nearly touching. 
dancing the world around, uh, palm to palm by the fragrant river. And this one of Francine recorded at KGB is we, we burned our way to Nowheresville. She needed to rest, that's all. Somewhere which was anywhere and out of the cold, she needed to wash a certain something out of her memory. Something bad that happened back in Guatemala or maybe just out there in the street. And there was not enough light in the candle to burn, but it was New Year's Eve and New Year's Eve in New York City is supposed to be special. It's supposed to be a time of new beginnings and happy endings. It's supposed to be a moment when time stops worrying about itself and considers itself lucky and fine and almost alive. And maybe I could help her with that. Maybe I could buy her a drink. And she was nearly 18, but she couldn't exactly prove it. And her sister lived in Brooklyn and told her to look for a place with a phone booth. And there was a phone booth in the hallway, but her sister hadn't called yet. And that's why she was hanging around. You see, it took two and a half days on a Greyhound bus to get here. And the people on the bus were stupid and crazy. And the man in the seat next seat to her wouldn't leave her alone. And this place was warm and cozy. And they just left her alone. Thank Jesus for that. People ought to leave each other alone and just be kind, she said. There was a war back home and it had ruined everything. The people were poor and the people got angry and decided to do something about it. So the soldiers began coming around with their Yankee guns and the people were dead and dying and the village burned and her brother was dead at the age of 14, a bullet hole through his forehead. And she liked my eyes, she said, they're empty and inviting. Can I just show you how we dance, she said, back in my village. And I said, sure, of course, why, why not? I'm not much of a dancer, but I could dance to it. It was a dance my body recognized, a refugee dance. And she swung me in her arms like a cradle, like a grave, like we were two shipwrecked sailors swinging in the bottomless pit of the same empty sea. And the weight of the world lifted and lifted, and the phone in the hallway rang off the hook, and time stopped. We burned our way to Nowheresville, and then we sat back down, and it was New Year's Day. Thank you. George, that was amazing. Look in the chat if you don't believe me. <laughs> that was just beautiful, gorgeous. Um, what have you got coming up? I mean, what? just talk about one of the many things, but what have you got coming up? Well, I have a new album coming out. Um, it'll come out on Spotify um, called Nowheresville, and it's got that poem on it. Oh, it's got, wonderful. Um, yeah. It's live performances over the years in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts and, and Kansas City and um, uh, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico and various locations around the country. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that is that poetry that's set to music or? Well, in a couple of cases, you know, it was mm -hmm. like when I was in Lowell, uh, uh, David Amram's drummer was uh, was backing me up and a bass player was backing me up. So some with music, some without. Wonderful. Um, where could we find you? Where can you find me? <laughs> yes. How could we like follow you and hear more of you? In well, if you're in Florida, I'll be in St. Augustine, Florida for the festival there. If you're in Medellin, Colombia, you can see wow. me there. Yeah. Online? Huh? Uh, could we, how could we find you online? Oh, you know, well, I, I mean, I do the, I do the, the, Poets building bridges. That'd be a good way for you. Know, oh, first yeah. segment of every month is a, a triangulation of groups of poets from three different locations around the world. And I host that on behalf of the Walt Women Birthplace. So that's that's a short bet to catch me there. Hey, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, George, and sharing your wonderful work with us. And um, that is going to do it for the Prose Garden. Um, I want to thank 
our readers, um, Michael Martone, um, Patricia Bidar, Suda Balakapal, Michael Shizniewski, I know that I messed that one up, Shizniewski, Catherine Kopa, Pamela Painter, and George Wallace. My wonderful co-host, Meg, Wall uh, Meg um, <laughs> oh, Chris, oh. sorry. <laughs> Lost it there, Meg Pokris, and uh, our bouncer today, Andrea Marcusa, and um, I'm Francine Witt for the Prose Garden, and um, drive safely. Good night. Okay.